Merry Christmas Eve, everybody. I am Ross, one of the pastors here, and it's my joy to welcome you to Redeemer for our Christmas Eve worship service. And special welcome to any guests who are here with us this evening. I see lots of family who's either in from out of town or returning home. Uh, it's so good to have you or any anyone visiting from us from just the area or the neighborhood and looking for a place to worship on Christmas Eve. It is it's good to have you. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to worshiping and celebrating our Savior this evening. On August 25, 1944, an American journalist reported from Paris saying, I have never seen in any face such joy as radiated from the faces of people of Paris this morning. And of course, some of you may know, if you know your history, that that joy was because the, the French and Allied armies had finally freed Paris from the brutal four-year occupation of the Nazis of that town. And many of you have probably seen some of the images or video clips of how the streets were flooded with people in joyful procession celebrating their liberation. And, and a joy like that, I think, somewhat captures the spiritual joy and celebration and relief of the Christmas, the true Christmas story that we worship and celebrate tonight, where, where we celebrate the invasion of the good into our sin-occupied world and hearts, and it's chasing out of town uh, of all that is evil, freeing us from its tyranny. This is what we celebrate together this evening. So would you rise as God calls us into his presence from Isaiah 9 and Luke 2. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Glory to God in the highest, and peace among those with whom he is pleased. Father, we come freely into your special presence this evening because your Son came sacrificially down from heaven. We worship you this evening as your children because your Son became a child. Fill our hearts this evening, Holy Spirit, as you filled the hearts of the shepherds, angels, Mary, and the wise men. Fill them with wonder joy, and love at the coming of your Savior in this wor into that world that night and, and into our hearts would we worship together this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together.
Luke 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Verses 8 through 20. 
And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone all around them. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them and into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby laying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, and it had been told them. We'll stand again and sing. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the new. from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 38. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit to the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God. And he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And his father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and 37, and then as a widow until she was 84. And she never left the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption of Israel. This is the reading of God's word. You all may be seated. Well, welcome to Redeemer. It's great to be with you all tonight. And uh, it's just a a joy, whether you're here or if you're joining us online, uh, to be able to spend some time to reflect on the coming of Jesus and the incarnation that he came, God in the flesh, to rescue and to redeem us, just as God had promised, beginning very on early in the gospel, uh, revealed in the gospels, but promised even in the book of Genesis. The last several weeks, if you've been with us on Sundays, We've had a series entitled Waiting on God. Now, all of us know waiting can be hard, especially for good things, right? How many of you are excited and waiting for tomorrow morning? Anyone excited about tomorrow morning? Yes, young and old are putting their hands up. Yes, we're all, I know you're excited. Come on, don't just smile at me. Like, yeah, yes. Um, And sometimes we get up earlier than we ought to, you know, when we're really excited or have trouble going to sleep. So waiting for good things can be hard, but what we've been focusing on specifically is how do we wait on God in really hard times? How do we wait on God when we feel like we have no more strength left? How do we wait on God in uncertainty? How do we trust in the unknown? How do we find joy in the midst of sorrow? And so we spent time seeing what the Bible says about those things to help us know how to actively wait on God. Now tonight, we're going to look at that same theme. It might not be what you expected to hear tonight exactly, because Tonight we want to consider how do you wait on God in times of prolonged silence? I mean, we do know Mary had to wait for nine months to see the promise of God come true. When the angel had come and said, you're going to have a child, and she's like, what are you talking about? And they tell him this miraculous way that through the Holy Spirit she was going to conceive and give birth to the promised hero, the rescuer Jesus. But she had to wait nine months to see that come to fruition. But we see two people here. Simeon, who probably was older, we aren't, don't know exactly how old, old he was, but Anna, who was almost 90 at least, who were willing to wait with hope. Not just after a short time, I mean some of us struggle and hardship to know how can I get through this day, or this week, or, or this month. But what happens when waiting and the apparent silence of God turns from months to years? and years to decades. How do you not just give up and become discouraged? When we lose hope, friends, that's when parents quit looking for their prodigal child to return, or spouses give up on their marriage, or people give up on their leaders, or leaders give up on their people. It's when we exchange faith for cynicism, hope for discouragement, courage for despair. It's almost impossible to go on and live life how God designed it in a state of constant hopelessness. Again, what do you do when you're waiting on a promise from God or you're waiting for God to act in a certain way but you just don't see it? Day after day after day. So that's what I want us to think about some this morning, that we're going to look and see what we can learn from Simeon and Anna uh, there's, there's a few things we can discern. 
But we want to also understand this beautiful thing that Simeon says. Because it's interesting, he's often known, I mean, throughout uh, the centuries, people have sung the nunc dimittis. That's the Latin term. I probably mispronounced it because I don't know any Latin. So you can tell me later on your way out, those of you who do. But they sing Simeon's song of the delight and trust in the salvation of God. But the song doesn't usually sing about the suffering that Mary's going to have. Now, again, it might seem odd tonight because everyone's excited. It's Christmas. We often think of the birth of Jesus. We don't want to think about some of the sad things that's, that are going to happen to Jesus. But see, the Bible from the very beginning wants us to understand there has always been a shadow over Bethlehem. There's always been a shadow over the manger. Because his very mission, what Simeon says, is he came to be a light for revelation of the Gentiles and glory to the people of Israel. And the way he would do that was not only through his perfect sinless life, but through his substitutionary death, meaning he switched places. Isaiah says it this way, that he took on himself the sins of us all. And so what we see is that Jesus came to live and to die so that he could be the salvation for his people. So that's kind of where we're going to go. But I want to step in for a minute into the life of Simeon and Anna. We don't know a whole lot about Simeon. We don't know if he is a priest in the temple, but we know he regularly went to the temple and he would look at the people. It's like he came in the room tonight and he's looking around for some of the babies. And he's trying to find them and he'd kind of look at each baby, look at them in and he'd move on to the next. Because he had been promised by God. Again, we don't understand how or this was communicated, but he knew that before he would take his last breath, before he would die, he would see God's promised hero, the rescuer, the Messiah, the Christ come. And so he was persuaded, and day after day, he would go to the temple, he'd look around for the babies, and he'd go to the next family. Day after day, and it's not that child. Month after month, year after year. At the same time, Anna, who is now, and I say maybe 90, the way they write it, it's kind of weird, we're not sure, she was at least 87, could have been more. And She's been probably living now in these later years in her life in the temple. She too is looking for the Redeemer of Israel, the redemption of Israel. And the consolation of Israel, that's the word comforter. I, in fact, the prophet Isaiah used that to describe the Messiah who's going to come, who's going to comfort a people who are suffering. So again, I want you to be in Simeon and Anna's ordinary, routine, day after day life. There was a friend of mine when I lived in Philadelphia, he had the same thing for lunch every day. Two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and a banana. Every day. For like 20 years, he'd been having the same lunch. I mean, I like peanut butter and jelly too, but come on, like there's got to be some other things. But this is what they're doing, routine, after routine, after routine, and God still has an answer, there's still this silence. God, where, where's the promise? Where's this promised child who's going to rescue us? And so Simeon's looking and Anna's looking for a long time. How well do you do with long waits? We've talked this about before. Like, How long is it before you honk when the person in front of you doesn't pull away? Like, Do you count? I do three, like a long three, you know, like a three second in the lane kind of call. That's what I do. And then I do a friendly beep beep. Now, if it gets to six, then it's like, eh, you know, what, where, what irritates you when someone has 15 instead of the 12 items in express lane? How many of you got irritated tonight because someone in the family wasn't ready to get here on time? Ooh, I see a few people like, we're not great at waiting, let alone think about the ordinary going through daily life and it seems like God's not there. I bet all of you have experienced that. And I promise you, if you haven't, there'll probably be a day that you will. And you wonder, God, where are you? How do you wait in silence, prolonged silence, with hope? How could Anna and Simeon be able to still trust and take God at His promises? Well, let's see what happens, and then we'll think about that briefly at the end. But one day was different. 
imagine you go in, you've been doing the same thing, looking for that baby, but something feels different about today. And you just know. You walk in and you know. I mean, it was like if tonight you saw someone coming and you're like, that's the baby. This is it. I mean, you can almost feel the chills going down your spine as you go and, and you pass through these other parents. And there you see this baby child, this little child, this teen mom and her husband. And you ask, can I hold him? And as you hold him, you realize that God has kept his promises. The promise that he made to Eve in the garden that through you I will send a child who will have the ultimate victory. That through Abraham, this is the child that fulfilled the promise to Abraham. This is the child that he's holding that fulfilled the promise to King David. This is the hero. This is the rescuer. I mean, all babies are fun to hold, but this is the king of kings. And there are Joseph and Mary watching him just, if he was like me, of course, he'd cry. I'm a crier, I know, and I hate it, but I'd, I'd have been bawling. Like, this is him! This is the promised one! I mean, all of us have done it when you've held a baby, right? I mean, you just look at it and you hear people say things like, look at those long fingers. Yep, it's going to be a piano player. Look at those long legs. Yeah, volleyball. Ooh, look at those shoulders. Linebacker, you know? I mean, we just look at the child and we begin to dream, right? We, what's this child going to be? And he begins to sing. And he sings this great song. I've seen the salvation that you prepared, God. He's going to be a light to the Gentiles. Again, a promise that this hero isn't just for Israel. This hero is for everyone, which is great news for us who are probably all Gentiles here tonight. This promise is for us. It says, and he's the glory of Israel. In the beginning of the Gospel of John, John writes this amazing statement. You may have heard it before. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what John is saying is Jesus is that Word. He was the Creator, and he was with God and spoke all things into being. And he is God himself. And then he says this really amazing thing that we don't, see as well in our English translations. It says, and he came and he dwelled among us. That word actually could be translated, he tabernacled among us. Now, we don't really talk much about tabernacles, but before Israel could build the temple, they had this portable place of worship that they would put in the center of the camp that God would come and be with his people. And they would say, there is God in his presence. And so what John is saying is the glory of God has come down in the person of Jesus all of these promises that were symbolized by the tabernacle and by the temple, the reality is here in Jesus. He will be a light to the Gentiles. The glory of God will come. We will see him. And Israel will see the glory of God himself in the person of Jesus. Friends, this is amazing stuff. This is what we celebrate at the incarnation. Not just the birth of a child, but the birth of the Messiah, the promised rescuer. And his parents marveled. Wouldn't you? I mean, I'd be happy. He's like, yeah, he's going to be a linebacker. Awesome. And he can play the piano. And long legs. He's going to be a leaper, you know. I mean, all these things you dream. But then he says something kind of hard. And most of us wouldn't say this to a mom who just had a baby eight days ago. I wouldn't recommend it. Unless God tells you to say it. He says, Mary, your soul is going to be pierced with a sword. Yeah, he's going to bring the, the falling and the rising of many. Could have one of two meanings. I, I think it's this idea that people are going to be humbled before him. And as they humble themselves before the king of kings, they will be raised and lifted up. That word rising is the same word used throughout the rest of the New Testament for resurrection. So as Jesus comes, he's going to, be able to discern people's hearts, which is a really scary thing. He knows ourselves better than we do. He knows what we're really committed to, what we really worship. And you have this opportunity. You're either going to fall before Jesus and say you're king and be raised up, or you'll oppose him and be his enemy. He says, Mary, these things are going to happen to your son Jesus, and you're going to have your heart broken. She doesn't understand what it means. She doesn't know that when he's in his 30s, she's going to be there when he dies. That she'll see him beaten and crucified. 
You know, he didn't say as he held the baby, yeah, he's going to be stricken, smitten, and afflicted. The words that the prophet Isaiah would have to say happened to the Messiah. He didn't say he'll take the iniquity on us all. He is the Redeemer, the one who will give himself. The one who will be crucified and placed by other robbers. But see, the message, the good news of the gospel has always been joy through sorrow. Joy through suffering. Life through death. And that shadow that was over the first Christmas there in Bethlehem cast a shadow over our life as well. And the question that Simeon was wondering, God, are you going to show me this promise the statement that he makes that I'm ready to depart now because I know my salvation is real. How do you answer that question this Christmas? I know you may not have been thinking about that as you came tonight, as you were dragged by family to come to the Christmas Eve service and thought candles are kind of cool unless you have a two-year-old, then it's terrifying. But it's kind of a fun service. And, um, but man, my mortality, my life, my death, to contemplate that on this evening is one of the sweetest privileges we have. Because it, it really is in this moment where Simeon says, this is who he is. He's the light to the Gentiles, the glory for Israel. And he will bring that light, he will bring that glory through his death and resurrection. And it's an invitation for us to trust in that and to rest in that and find the resurrection hope and life in Jesus. That's the good news of the Gospel. That Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Who believes in me will never walk in darkness. I don't know about you, but the past couple of years have had some real darkness. And what's kept me hopeful are the promises of God. When I can look at everything else and say, I don't have a clue what's going on right now but I take God at his word. That's what we can learn from Simeon and Anna. And if you've been with us the last few Sundays, it, it's kind of repetitive, but God gives us these real, ordinary, regular paths to help us be hopeful in the midst of uncertainty, sorrow, and prolonged silence. I think it's no mistake that Anna and Simeon were regularly at the temple because they're at the temple where it's where God met his people, where they were reminded of his promises, where they saw the sacrifices that were a foreshadowing of Jesus, where they saw the symbolism of all that the Messiah would be, and they said, God, these are real tangible things. They remind me that the, your word is true. Even though it's been a month, a year, decades, I trust that your promise is true. And they needed one another. In fact, it says Anna was telling to all who still believed about the redemption of Jerusalem. There were people there, not just Anna and Simeon, who still believed. Now, there were a lot of religious people there still who went through the motions, but they didn't believe yet. They'd kind of given up hope. So how do we have hope in prolonged silence? By meeting with God's people, by hearing weekly the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and how he transforms our lives now and forever. But we also see that Anna did some things individually as well. It tells her that she worshipped and fasted and prayed night and day. We have these, again, well-worn patterns. We can hear God's voice through His Word. We know we have God's ear. We can speak to Him in prayer. We have the body of Christ, the church, to be able to encourage us. We don't wait alone. And isn't that the hardest thing? When you feel all alone? Like no one knows what you're going through. Like no one knows the silence you're feeling. The ache you're feeling. The doubt you're feeling. The cynicism that's creeping over your heart. And yet, it's common to all of us in different seasons, different measures, different circumstances. But I think what's beautiful about the body of Christ is almost guarantee that when you're down, someone near you is not. And at times they can hold the light for you when your wick has grown dim. Until you catch your breath. Until you'll be able to realize your feet are anchored on the promises of God. 
So how do we wait? We wait by believing and taking God at His Word, which is not easy, and we need each other to do that. But if Simeon and Nana could do that before they had actually seen Jesus, and we get to see Him in the Gospels, and we know that He is the one who died and rose again, and sits at the right hand of God, and that we've seen Him work miraculous things in our lives, in the life of the church throughout history, And this is why we can say Merry Christmas. This is why we can say joy to the world, the Lord has come. This is why we can say peace on earth to all who rest and trust in Him. This is why we gather tonight. There's a, if you've been here, you know that I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy, so I'll give you one Lord of the Rings quote before we leave here. What would it be without the Lord of the Rings, right? And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's this book where there's this good versus evil. And one of the heroes who has just conquered the evil one, the enemy, passes out thinking he's going to die. And he wakes up in this beautiful, glorious house. And he sees one of his friends whom he thought had died earlier on in the adventure. And he says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? And Gandalf said, a great shadow has departed. And then he laughed, and the sound was like music, or like water in a parched land. And as he listened, he thought, the thought came to him that he had not heard laughter, the pure sound of merriment for days upon days without count. Friends, your waiting won't be in vain. It may be really painful, but there is a day when Jesus will come again and it will make all sad things untrue. We need that promise almost just stamped on our eyeballs so that we see it every day. He's going to make all sad things untrue. If not in this life, then in the new heavens and the new earth. And that is the hope that can help us in times of prolonged silence. As we remind ourselves, that the Lord has come and He will come again. Let's pray together. Father, the reason we can sing Joy to the World, the reason we can say Merry Christmas is because You sent Your perfect Son, Jesus, to take our place. And as we celebrate the birth of Your Son with family and friends tonight and tomorrow, Help us to reflect on the incredible gift that is ours, this eternal life to be found in Jesus, this life that transforms how we live now and promises one day that all sad things will be untrue. And Lord, I pray for those who are grieving, those who have lost loved ones who are in the midst of prolonged silence. Lord, be their comfort, be my comfort as we look to Jesus, our great comforter, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you will, let's stand and sing together, Joy to the World.
I'm going to give some instructions before I read from Scripture. Um, I'm going to have this candle, and I'll come to the first few people on each of the rows. And the way we do it, everybody, is when you have an unlit candle, I want you to take it and put it on top. That way we're not dripping wax on anybody or anything. Okay? So you, if you have an unlit candle, you'll come down. If you hold the candle, just hold it straight. All right, that's the thing. And then the other is on the way out, um, just outside the double doors, there's a basket, and we invite you to uh, put the candles in the basket on your way out. So let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has a light shone. And then in John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who ever follows me will never walk in darkness. Jesus, the light of the world, has come.
This is the good news of the gospel. Christ the Savior is born. It takes away the sins of the world. Merry Christmas.